Hi, this is Marjan Love, and this is Marjan's Musings. And today's show, I'm going to try to give you an overview of silk, a little bit of its history, and what I've been doing with it lately. My uh, very first experience with silk was this piano cover. It's embroidered in silk thread, and it's an antique. A lot of people, when they think of silk, they think of lingerie. So I brought in to show you my silk bathrobe and behind me here, my friend Jim calls a cacophony of color. These are silk scarves that I made by the shibori method. If you look at them, you can see that there's some variation, but they have kind of a consistency of tone depending which color they are. You dye silk like this by taking the silk fabric, which comes to you in a plastic wrapper, and on the wrapper is a code. Mine says MH814. What that means is this particular scarf is a machine-hemmed scarf. It's 8 mom two M's. It looks like millimeter, but it's really mom. 8 M, and it's 14 inches before it's hemmed. And the silk comes to you not quite white. It's a slightly creamy shade. And this is one of these big, luxurious scarves back here. But this isn't the kind of scarf I started on. When I first started to paint silk, the silk was expensive, so I started with these little ones. And these come eight mom as well, and that type of silk is called habitai. You can learn all about these kinds of uh, information from the Dharma Trading Company. If you're going to paint or dye silk, and those are two different processes, there's paints, and then there's dyes, and there's different types of dyes. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that because each one's different and each one has its own unique requirements. But the Dharma Trading Company, everybody I talked to who painted silk said, talk to these people. They're honest, they're reliable, they're quick, they get your order correct. And so far I've been very pleased with them. There are dozens and dozens of different kinds of dye. If you'd like to try silk painting and you're not ready to jump in to hundreds and hundreds of colors of dye, because I'm serious, there's like all sorts of dyes. You can start out with a starter kit, which is what I did. Jacquard, which is a, a famous name in silk dyes, makes a starter kit. And my little flyer is a bit stained because I used my starter kit. And they tell you for your very first project, you'll need a silk scarf or fabric, plastic cups or an ice cube tray for blending colors, brushes, silk pins or tacks to stretch the fabric, paper towels, which you use a lot of paper towels, gutta resist, or there's a newer, more environmentally friendly water resist, gutta is a rubber product. In order to get the gutta thin, you have to use a chemical that you need really good ventilation. It has volatile vapor. And in order to get it out of the silk afterwards, you have to dry clean the silk to get the gutta out. And then Jacquard silk colors or the silk color kit, water, and a stretcher frame. And we're going to do some stuff with a very inexpensive stretcher frame that you can make at home. In the little flyer that they send you with the kit, they say, although Jacquard silk colors are available in 20 shades, most colors in the spectrum may be mixed from three primary colors, yellow, magenta, 
and cyan. The yellow, magenta, and cyan are what printers use, but they also use black to make tones. And in the printing, you use screens to make your pastels. In dyeing of silk, you thin down the dye with either water or alcohol. And this one lady, uh, her name is Karen, and I think it's Strizik. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing her last name correctly. But if you type in Karen silk scars or uh, silk painting, she'll pop up on the internet. And she does some fascinating things. One of her students teaches how to make the PVC pipe frame that I'm going to work with today. What do you really need to get started? Well, you have to have some sort of brushes. The recommended brushes are Sumi brushes. This one is splayed because when you buy the Sumi brush, and this one was only like, I don't know, four or five dollars, whereas good watercolor brushes can be up to a hundred dollars for a, a pure sable brush. Do not waste your money on a good sable brush for silk dyeing because the dyes are acid dyes and they'll eat your brushes. This was a more expensive uh, Sumi brush. I had to glue it together and then tie it because the acid dyes split the horn. So don't spend a lot of money on your silk brushes. What you need is a soft supple brush and in watercolor natural bristles work better. I have some friends at the 10 pound studio that are using uh, artificial fiber brushes and they work just fine for the dyes. They have a soft supple feel and they're less expensive. And then like I said the dyes are hard. I put this back together with a, a milkshake straw because the brush was still okay, but the bamboo shaft split. One of the things I learned about that is I have a plastic bin to keep my goodies in when I'm not working. If you dry your brushes in a bamboo mat, and you can buy these at the Beverly Wholesale Art Supply Store, if you put your brushes away in a mat, and dry them in a ventilated mat, you'll get less splitting of the ferrules and less splitting of the handles. I talked to you about, you know, the jacquard. They gave you a chart in the back so that if you wanted to start out with yellow, magenta, and cyan, there's a primary colors mixing chart on the back of the little flyer for the beginner set. And they tell you that if you want to make a golden yellow, you use 25 parts yellow to one part magenta. Well, how are you going to know what a part is? I started out with an eyedropper and I would put so many drops. That can get really tedious. What I found more useful, and you can probably pick these up at your local CVS or Rite Aid or Walgreens, is a syringe. It doesn't have a needle. It's not like, you know, you're going to give somebody an injection. It's a syringe that people use to give medication to babies or people who need to have a certain amount of liquid medication. But on it are the milliliters and fractions of a tablespoon, whichever you're more comfortable using. So suppose you wanted to make orange. You take three yellow parts, whatever part you decide, whether it's a milliliter or whether it's a tablespoon, and you take two parts magenta and you can make your own orange. These are real handy and they're not real expensive. So if you wanted to start in without a huge investment to see if you like it, silk painting takes a bit of patience and practice. It's not something that is really easy or necessarily intuitive, especially if you've worked in other media.
One of the things that you'll need is some sort of rubber band. I bought from Dharma Trading a set of rubber bands and they're all the same thickness and they're all the same size. I was at the dollar store and I saw a bag of rubber bands for a dollar. I thought, boy, that's less expensive than Dharma. I'll get those. No, we're going to find out how much of a mistake that was today because I brought in my frame and I'm going to show you how to frame up your silk and I'm going to show you how to prepare it for dyeing. But before we do that, I want to warn you that there are things out there that are called crepe de chine that are not really silk. This was dyed over four different days at class and it was a set of hot air balloons and birds and it was brilliant brilliant colors i it said crepe de chine right on it and i went to wash it out and i tried something different that's the only area that stayed and that's not dye that's paint so if you have a piece of fabric and you're not sure whether it's silk or not, go to the edge and pull some threads loose. When you've got some threads, take a Bic or a match and light the threads. If it's stinky like burning hair, a little different but kind of that quality, that's silk. If it smells chemical, and the flame continues to go and it balls up, that's usually polyester. And polyester will not take dyes. This was all brilliant colors. And you can see where I use the paint is still there, but there's spaces that there should be color that the dye washed out. So I didn't realize when I bought my crepe de chine polyester, that it was polyester, and I bought yards of it. Well, what am I going to do with all this silk that isn't really silk? It feels like silk, it looks like silk, but it doesn't act like silk. Well, Jacquard comes to the rescue with textile paints. And I brought you in a set of textile paints to show you. And they come in your basic colors, the yellow, red, uh, blue, but also green, turquoise, russet, violet, and periwinkle blue. And these you don't have to steam. And we'll talk more about that later. When you use these, you set them with an iron. So the color stays on the polyester with an iron. The only difference between the paint and the dye that I can tell is the fabric is stiffer. It has a crunchy feel to it. Have you ever gotten a t-shirt and it has a logo on the front? And after a while it gets crazed in the dryer and it feels thick and a little crunchy. The paints make the silk or the polyester a little stiffer. When we talk about silk, one of the things we talk about is the hand. This antique piece is charmeuse. It's about a 12 to maybe a 20 mom. It's thick. So as you're looking at the different scarves in the catalogs, the lower the number mm, the thinner and finer the silk until you get all the way to a gauze that you can see through. You can see right through this. You can buy silk knit. And this I got at the John Tarr shop. The reason people use silk undergarments in the winter is they're very thin, so they don't make you look fat. They're very fine gauge, but they're warm. Silk knit was very popular in the United States in between World War I and World War II. And in those days, 
women wore silk stockings and a garter belt because they didn't make pantyhose yet. And then they found out that silk stockings were expensive, but they were also fragile. You had to be very careful how you washed these. You had to use a special mild soap and you had to dry them sort of stretched out so that they weren't all wrinkled. So some bright American came up with the idea of making nylon stockings. And nylon, they could put a little latex in with it so that the nylon was stretchy. It wore a little better. It didn't get holes and if you were careful with it, you could get nylon to be very sheer and very fine like silk stockings. And because the process didn't require sericulture, you didn't have to grow mulberry bushes, you didn't have to cultivate moths that would lay eggs to eat mulberry leaves and then take the little cocoons and boil them and take 10 to 30 strands of cocoon to make one thread. You just made the nylon. And so people found that nylon stockings suited them better than silk stockings. And I can remember all through the 50s and the 60s, people wore stockings and sometime around, I don't know, maybe 1960 or so, pantyhose happened and people were thrilled. They got rid of the awkward garter belt with the garters and the elastic straps and all that. Silk is kind of in an odd situation. It's, you know, if you think of history, silk was so prized that the silk road developed between China and North Africa all the way up to France. And the French are a very sensuous people and they found silk and they were like, oh la la, they love silk. And because the French got interested in silk, they developed looms, special looms, to weave the silk. And the Jacquard loom was invented. And in the early days, the loom had punch cards across the top of the loom so that it could do pictures. You could actually make pictures in colored thread on the loom. This is a woven silk. It's from Tibet and it's a Buddhist emblem of the conch shell. And the conch shell is to sing out the sound of Buddha's Dharma teaching. It's actually woven with gold thread. A whole lot of um, what happened with silk because it was considered a luxury item, a very valuable thing. People used silk in ways that were a little different. There's a whole lot of embroidered silk because silk was considered to be something precious and handwork was considered to be something that enhanced the value of this silk. One of my very first silks is this beautiful royal blue jacket. It's embroidered in peonies and chrysanthemums and it's 34 years old. It's starting to fray around the, the frogs and the little detailing. And the reason I still keep it is Kevin bought it for me for my very first wedding anniversary. Even though I've become heavy and I think if I tried to wear it, it would look like a two pound bologna in a one pound bag, I won't throw it out. It's, uh, it's something that my husband gave me as a love token. But I wanted to show you a little bit about the frame. 
you can go down to any plumbing supply place and get a PVC T. They're like two, three dollars. And if you like to work sitting down, if you cut your PVC pipe and you have extra lengths, if you get a, a 45 degree angle and you'll need two of them, you can make a stand so that you don't have to stand up to paint your silk. You can put it up on a table, definitely protect your table. You need to protect your table from the dyes. Even though the dyes are non-toxic, so they don't have volatile vapors that you're going to inhale and injure yourself. The liquid dyes we're talking about now, the beginner's dyes. They come in little bottles, and I'll show you the bottles. So you can get these bottles, and you can paint freely with them on the fabric, and they will not injure you. Um, you should invest in gloves. You're going to need gloves. You know, like Playtex rubber gloves, you're going to need gloves. Why? Because when you get the silk out of the package, it's a little stiff. It has sizing on it. You need to get rid of the sizing. The, the little caterpillar that makes that cocoon has a waxy substance, and some of the cocoons are actually a yellow color. So in order to get this beautiful creamy color, when they boil the silk, they put a chemical in the water to take the wax, the waxy substance, out of the silk. So you need to make sure you get all the wax out of the silk if you're going to apply dye, because anywhere the wax is, the dye won't set. Now we talked about gutta resist. This says gutta, but if you look very carefully, it's a gutta a lo. French again, L. E-A-U. What does that mean? It's a water-based gutta. It's not a rubber gutta. And it has a very long point. And this one is copper colored. And I'm going to apply some and show you how it looks. The metallic guttas are lovely. They come in, I don't know, maybe seven, eight shades. You need to take them out of their jars. The jars are much less expensive than the little tubes per ounce. So this little tube is, I don't know, it says on here, 20 milliliters. You can get a jar for not a whole lot more than that tube. So you have to decant the gutta into a little squeezy jar and it has a nib on it but the nib is coarse so the line of gutta that you get is thick and you don't want that unless you want it. <laughs> if you look at my scarf across the bottom of the table one side says love and the other side says hope. And that was done in gutta so that when I painted the dye on with my paintbrush, I got the words in resist. This little silver point tightens down the opening of the aperture of the squeeze bottle so that you have a much finer line. Unfortunately, the little top won't close over it. And if you're using these little silver nibs, when you're done your silk painting, they can dry and clog. So I have an old prescription bottle for one of my medications, and what I do when I'm done with my nib, I take it back off and store it in water.
And my friend Susan taught me that. She's like, oh, don't mess with trying to stick a seed bead needle through that thing to open it back up. Store it in water so it can't dry out. There's little tricks that you learn. And I found the silk community is um, friendly, supportive, willing to share their knowledge. They're not all about, oh, this is my special technique. They're a very uh, caring group, and um, they're willing to teach you things. So I brought in today an entire bucket of these little paints because I wanted to show you that some of them, this one here is a textile color. It's white, and it's opaque. Some of them, which are called Lumiere, this one is a interference violet. So the paints are lovely, but they're more for wall art than they are for a scarf that you would wear because they stiffen the fabric. I brought you in a beautiful multicolored red and blue scarf kind of to honor that. If you can see, it has a sparkle and a sheen to it. And what that is, is a gold gutter resist. The resist acts as a fence. It keeps the dye from spreading beyond where you want it to go. So the little blue leaves at the edge are entering the space of the red. And they're not turning the area purple. And we're going to see how dyes blend, but we're all also going to see how dyes work when you want them to blend, and that's a whole different thing. I have a beautiful one here by Ivanova Trump. Right now in election season, I don't wear it very often. I think I'm leaning towards Bernie. I'm listening very carefully to Hillary, and I think I'm leaning towards Bernie. But this is a beautiful piece. Ivanova did this. She used to be a fashion model, but she came out and she said she thought that uh, Donald would make a good president. This is the woman that divorced him for cheating. My husband said that if you're an officer in the United States Army and if you're caught in infidelity, you can lose your commission. It's considered um, a breach of promise, a breach of valor. And if you'll break that vow, will you break your vow to the army? Now, how do you get your PVC pipe to be the lengths that you need? It's a ratchet PVC pipe cutter. And you put your pipe into the jaws of the cutter. It opens like this, and then it ratchets down. and cuts the pipe really well. These are about $20, $25. And the reason that the PVC alternative works for me is because it's lightweight. You can write the dimensions of your pipe on the pipe so that when you go to assemble the pipe with the corners, it's easy. When you're done dyeing a red scarf, if you'd like to shift to a yellow, you wipe down the pipe and clean the pipe. You also need to clean your clips and your rubber bands so that today's blue doesn't wind up on tomorrow's pink and make you very unhappy. And this lovely fan was painted with a very delicate hand. I was very curious about that. And again, there's a French phrase that came to my rescue, antifusante. It means it doesn't allow the dye to spread. And you can buy that from Jacquard. It's called No Flow. No Flow needs to be put on the silk and allowed to dry prior to painting if you want to paint fine 
detail without using gutta. One of the things that intimidated me about silk is that to use real dyes, you need to steam set the fabric. So steam setting fabric requires an entire process and a steamer, a professional steamer, is $1,380, not including tax or shipping. They stand six and a half, seven feet tall. And what they basically are is a wide, deep kettle that you fill with water and think of like an electric frying pan. It has a heating element in the bottom of the kettle and then think of a double walled stove pipe that goes up six feet and has a domed lid with a vent hole so that it doesn't blow up like a pressure cooker. You know, if you didn't have the emergency safety valve in the pressure cooker, too much steam can cause a pot to explode. So these steamers, I'll show you a photo of them. They're about eh, six, seven feet tall. They're double walled and they have a rheostat at the bottom for how much heat you want to put in. And you want just enough heat to create steam, but not so much heat that you damage the fabric. I don't have a mic today, so I actually get to move around a little bit when I talk to you. And um, I wanted to point out some things. This scarf I wore on a prior show, but it's that crepe, it's gauzy. You can see right through it. And the designs are painted and someone went back over the lines of gutta and beaded the gutta lines as an embellishment. These little scarves that were done in what's called a shibori method, this one is done in citron, regular yellow, and deep yellow, and with a little touch of carmine. I think it's wise that when you begin to paint silk, you don't start to tackle something this big. It's expensive to buy silk that size. So try something small. I wanted to show you a silk scarf that's been dyed, but it has not yet been steamed. And if you look, it's kind of crispy. You can see where I folded it. There's these sharp creases. It doesn't have the flow that these softer silks do because I haven't washed the dye or the resist out. But in order to dye silk, and have it not bleed onto the person that's wearing it. You have to do a process where you roll it up, but you put two layers of paper, one underneath and one on top, and then you roll it up like a jelly roll. And you make sure that your paper is longer than your scarf. I'm just doing this little one as a demonstration. If I was doing this properly for steaming, this entire little bird fan would be covered. None of it would be showing. You tape this and then you plunk this into your steamer. Now, I can't afford the big professional steamer. So what I got was a turkey roaster that's like an electric fry pan. Because a turkey roaster is big, I can put a piece this size in. You have to protect the silk from water. At this stage, it's very vulnerable to staining. If I dripped water on this red, you'd see a bullseye appear and the red would leave the area where the water was and make a water stain. 
once the scarf has been fixed, this one was fixed with um, a chemical dye set. You let the dye cure overnight, 24 hours is better, and you can use permanent dye set concentrate. You put it in a dish pan that is then never used for dishes. Anything that you're going to use with the silk dyes, don't eat off that stuff. Yes, they're non-toxic, but they all warn you if you're going to use it for dye, that's what it's used for. So we're going to get into the more active part of the program, but I wanted you to see that this is a dyed silk that was set with the liquid concentrate. I wanted to be able to do the delicate designs, the paintings, so that I didn't have to have all the gutta lines. So we're going to explore two different ways to do silk. One is going to be on wet silk, and the other one is going to be on dry silk that has antifusant. So I want to show you both ways so that, yes, it's an extra step, it's a little more expense, but some people prefer the control. That's all for now. This is Marjan, and this has been Marjan's Musings. Boy.